Good morning, everybody. What are we today? What are we? Where are we? We are June eighth, two thousand twenty-three, five forty-five a.m. Pacific time. Kicking off the Ask Me Anything, and so here we go. Hope everybody's day all around the world is off to a good start. I think a couple episodes ago, we somehow got on a tangent of kids' sports and all that stuff, and how they've gotten a little bit out of hand and ridiculous. And last night was exactly that, but my one of my, our boys had basketball practice, and by the time he finished, he's 13 years old, by the time he finished basketball practice and we got him back home, I walked through the door with him last night at about 10, 15 p.m. You know, he's got to get up for school. He's 13 years old, needs a ton of sleep. And, you know, of course, after all the practice and all that, he was hungry again, so another meal was made. He was soaking with sweat, so we had to take a shower. That's just ridiculous, right? Isn't that ridiculous? So, anyway, I see somebody post when will I be able to feel my legs again? Hopefully by the end of the day. Okay, so today's show brought to you by Strong Black Coffee to help me wake up and get through the day. We got some great questions. Uh, let's go ahead and kick it off. Oh, but before I do, I wrote myself some notes, things I just want to get out there, some housekeeping items. Number one, I 100% fully intend on going to the Rogue Invitational this year in Texas. So Lynchpin all around the world, it's an awesome event. If you can go, I recommend that you go. It's just fun, it's an intimate setting, there's great views from everywhere, you get to see Strongman as well as CrossFit stuff, there's, it's awesome. I have no idea if I'll be there just totally as a spectator or working or whatnot, it's, it's too far in the future, but no matter what, I plan on being there. And if I'm working, well, then the days will probably be pretty busy, but then afterwards, you know, we'll try to find some time to link up and all that. But if not, sweet. You can all sit in the stands every now and then and watch some, watch some events. So, um, yeah, so try to get to the Rogue Invitational if you can. We can kind of use it as a meetup, which would be awesome. Number two, I'm curious if anybody has an interest in getting together and doing like a Spartan race. Now, I know there's all sorts of Spartan races. I don't know a ton about Spartan races versus Tough Mudders, and maybe if somebody does, they can tell me the difference in the comments below or on this video when I post it on YouTube or whatever it happens to be. Um, maybe it's the old team guy in me. I don't want to unnecessarily get muddy just for the sake of being muddy. To me, that sounds silly and weird. Um, but you know, like doing a hard race that you happen to get muddy, great. But like, I don't want to just go through a mud puddle to say, look, now I'm muddy. Snap a photo of me. That sounds just peculiar. So that's why I think I'm leaning towards the Spartan, the Spartan race. I did a little research on them and you know, they can go from short to long. And I think there's a Spartan super and the beast. I might get my terminology mixed up. I think the super is a 10 K. So 6.2 miles of running with like 25 obstacles mixed in there. That seems very reasonable. Uh, and maybe I'm just flashing my, um, ignorance about the whole thing now, but based upon what we do, I don't see why anybody, we wouldn't be able to just show up, have fun with that, and you'll have a blast. Then there's the Spartan Beast, I want to say, which was, I believe, a half marathon with 30 obstacles. That seems like it would be uh, a little more crazy, <clears throat> but potentially in a good way and fun, especially if we had a crew of linchpinners there. Like, who cares? We'll jog, we'll walk when we need to walk, we'll shoot the breeze and talk, we'll throw a spear every now and then, do some burpees if we have to, then we can just jog or walk to the next obstacle, climb a wall and just have like an actual social blast the whole time. So if, you know, and they're all around the US. So if that sounds interesting, again, let me know in the comments, let me know on YouTube, the BTWB squads, let me know in the private Facebook group if people would be uh, down for that because that could just be a fun way to do something and then we can all like I don't know go out and get coffee before or after or a meal or something like that so and then the final thing is the workout demos people may have noticed that I'm starting to I just ask random people of the community like hey do you want to you know film yourself doing a workout of the day and I'll put it up either on Instagram or on the Cross of Lynchman YouTube channel and people have 
love that. There's been a great response to that. So if you haven't heard of that yet, but if you're interested in doing it, go to the CrossFit YouTube, CrossFit Lynchpin YouTube channel. Let me go there right now and find the right video. Go to the playlist called Workout Videos. And under that playlist, under the Workout Videos playlist, you will see a video that I posted recently entitled, do, 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 where, uh, Lynchpin Community Workout Videos. Lynchpin Community Workout Videos. Watch that video and then you'll get all the information about how to join, how to submit videos and all that good stuff. I basically, I've got a Google sheet that will get you on and post the upcoming workouts. You can claim the workout that you want and you get me a link to the video and then boom, we put it out there and, and life's good. Okay, I think that's all the housekeeping. Now let's dive into these excellent questions. Another sip of my coffee and away we go. Okay, here we go. First question from Eric CM. Eric has a few that are upvoted today. How do we tell the difference between letting our ego get in the way and pushing ourselves? I wonder when it's safe to take a chance and go further and when it's better to stick to known limits. Great question. Well, first of all, I guess the simple question is, you're never going to know your limits unless you actually allow yourself to fail and bump into them. I mean, that's the honest truth. So if you have never actually crashed and burned and failed, you don't know where your limits are. And so personally, I think there's great value to that. Um, now, that has to be tempered with a degree of common sense, which sadly we live in a world where you have to do that. Should you do anything just reckless and unsafe to a point that it's injurious? No, and hopefully that's so profoundly obvious that it doesn't need to be stated, but let me go ahead and state that anyway. But that whole concept of threshold training, finding your threshold, where if you're trying to do something complicated, whether it's clean and jerks, whether it's driving a car, playing a musical instrument, uh, whatever it happens to be, you're trying to do something complicated that takes technique and your brain engaged, and then you're trying to do that complicated thing quickly, well, at a certain point, you can keep increasing the pace and increasing the pace and increasing the pace. And as you do that, for most of us, at some point in time, the sloppiness of whatever it is that you're doing will start to become readily apparent and degrade whatever that movement or activity happens to be. And then past a certain point, too much degradation is wildly inefficient, no longer productive, and you have breached your threshold. That applies to everything. That's not just strength and conditioning. That's darn near everything in the world. And you're not going to find where your threshold is without bumping into it. So I'm actually really a big fan of bumping into it and knowing your limits, but you can test it. You should, you should bump into it but not deviate any safety protocols. So for example, don't try to lift something and find your limits that puts yourself in a wildly compromised spinal position. <clears throat> that wouldn't be a good way to test your limits. If you're doing um, death by burpees or something like that, and you think you're going off, you're going out at a pace that you can maintain and is a good pace, and then at the end you're like, hmm, I had more in the tank. Well, you can go out at a pace on death by burpees that's maybe a bit reckless, not unsafe because you're doing burpees, but you're going so fast that stamina wise, you're like, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to maintain this. And then you crash and burn and find out that you did go out too fast. Well, now you found your limits and you did it in a way that was perfectly appropriate, not potentially injurious and all that stuff. Same deal with maybe like a death by thrusters that we did recently. Well, I could take a chance as the minutes go by and say, you know what? I know I could play it safe. I'm gonna to try to knock out the set of 10 or the set of 12 or whatever it happens to be. Let's say it's a set of 12. I'm gonna do six, three, three. Like I think I can do that with short rests, short breaks, and I think I'm gonna achieve the set of 12 if I do that. Or I can say, you know what? The heck with it. Let's burn the boats on the shore. I'm gonna go for 12 and see if I can get 12 unbroken. And then I get like, eight and then I have the dumbbells on my shoulder and I'm huffing and puffing with no idea how I'm going to get another four and I don't put the dumbbells down I do one more miserable single and I re-rack the dumbbells and I don't know how I'm going to get two more 
and I finally get number nine or 10 or whatever it happens to be. And then that was so taxing because I didn't break it up that I just have to dump the dumbbells. I fall over and just hyperventilating and the minute goes by and I fail to achieve the set of 12. Where had I done 633, I most likely would have achieved the set of 12. Well, nothing I did there was potentially injurious. It was largely a stamina and a cardiorespiratory failure and I found my limit. And that's really useful, personally, in my opinion. So I think there are ways to find your limits that are smart and you can still maintain your health and fitness and it's just a learning experience for yourself. And there are probably movements and loadings and things that you could do that would not be a good idea. Same deal with like a six by 400 meter repeat. There's probably a pace that you can go out that is miserably uncomfortable yet sustainable or you can try to do a Steve Prefontaine, you know, <clears throat> the best pace is a suicide pace and today is a good day to die sort of thing and go for broke and either learn that, oh wow, I'm actually more capable than I realized. I held on to that pace, holy cow. I didn't know that I had that sort of next gear. Or you will learn as you have your hands on your thighs and you're bent over, potentially dry heaving on the ground, that you reached your limits and you cannot sustain that pace and that's okay. And maybe doing that on the third of six 400 meter repeats is so costly that the final three 400 meter repeats are by far not really that quick because you crushed yourself so much. That's okay. You're still out there doing 400 meter repeats. Even if the pace is a little slower. The day's a win. Fitness was achieved and life's good. So great question. Okay. Next one, also from Eric CM. We're all here to get fit for the long term. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, what does CrossFit or fitness look like for an older adult? For example, what does uh, intensity look like for an 80 year old? And somebody tagged somebody else in our community, which was great. This gentleman, Levi, who trains his dad regularly and posts awesome photos uh, of his dad. And Eric wrote uh, from, you know, real life, excuse me, uh, Levi wrote from really training his dad in real life. It depends on the person uh, as all things do. My dad has always been active and never really lifted weights. He knows how to push the envelope when he thinks a workout is in his wheelhouse. On the other hand, for his father-in-law, who is pretty sedentary and never worked out, jumping jacks can be intense. So I think when you hit a certain age, it becomes more about slowing the decline. Uh, dad has mentioned he doesn't feel strong, uh, doesn't feel, dad has mentioned he doesn't feel stronger and not a ton more mobile. I told him there's no way to measure how much we are slowing the decline. You've got external factors of intensity, red face, heavy breathing, etc., rate of perceived exertion, you know, you know, it goes on and on. Long story short, great answer, Levi. You know, this is, <clears throat> there are several things that are true. And here's one of the things that I, I liked back in the day about CrossFit and, and when Greg Glassman would tell the truth, even if it was unpopular. People would say things in an, um, maybe we're at a level one and somebody in the audience would raise a hand and be like, look, okay, great. Functional movement's great. Work capacity, great. High intensity, great. But even back then people were like, high intensity, like should you crush yourself every day in a workout? Like is that is that the point is that actually good for you in the long run and god bless him you know greg would say honestly he'd be like i don't know you know i'm i'm, I'm paraphrasing but he would basically tell the audience like look no one's ever done this before most of the world's been doing you know three sets of 10 on the bench press with a minute rest between each three sets of 10 dumbbell flies with a minute rest in between each not mixing any modalities and then you go onto the elliptical trainer for a casual 45 minutes and no one's doing anything intense no one's doing mixed modality training so is this stuff actually good for you in the long run i don't know all of the, all of you are currently taking part in the largest human experiment of high intensity training that has ever been conducted on the planet and we just don't know yet because no one's been doing it 20 or 30 years now you know fast forward i mean I'm coming up on almost doing 20 years of this myself, and there's a lot of lessons learned personally. And that's also why Greg said, look, the next evolution of CrossFit is not going to come from CrossFit HQ. 
it's going to come from the gyms, like Lynchpin, you know, out there doing this every day, observing their members, and then making the adjustments as needed. And that's a wonderful thing that we have here at Lynchpin, is instead of observing, you know, 100 people, I'm observing, observing thousands of people from all around the world and been doing that for years. And so that's why we have made adjustments that might seem different than classic CrossFit, even though we are classic CrossFit with the regard to do one thing a day and do it really well. I don't think there was anything wrong with that, but we don't burn it down every day. I don't actually think that's a good call at all. That's why we modulate our intensity from low to medium and to high. Uh, that's why we actually do days not for time. That was another, in my opinion and observation, necessary advancement and evolution as well. Um, we do far more like percentage-based work than what you would just see on, on classic cross where everything has a prescribed load all the time. We work that in there. Heavy days at a high heart rate are another thing. Um, just some interval training as well there also. Um, some strict gymnastics. You know, there's there's things that have evolved based upon, you know, what I've seen, observed, and implemented over the course of doing this for a very long time. So getting back to your question, what does it look like for an older adult? Eh, we might have some best guesses, but also we're not exactly sure 100%. But one of the things that, getting back to some of Greg Glassman's original theories that I tend to agree with him on this about, it was, a, it was his opinion that as you advance in years, and maybe it's in your 70s, could be late 60s, could be eight, whenever it happens to be for that, for that individual, instead of one workout a day where you're just kind of getting after it, that individual, the intensity piece might not be so important so much as the functional movements and the variance, because the functional movements can help preserve that range of motion that you need to live an independent, long, happy, healthy life to sustain your joints and all that, to keep you strong, to maintain your bone density, get your breathing a little bit and all that. So instead of one session that you get after it every day, that person much later in life might benefit from a small session that you move for 10 to 15 minutes in the morning at low to moderate intensity, and then another one in the afternoon. So you're, you're doing two smaller sessions and they're just moving sessions. And I tend to think at some stage in life that that is probably a pretty darn good course of action. So hopefully that Hopefully that helps you there. Let's see, I mean, but, but that's all the stuff that, you know, and just like I said a second ago, of how we are classic CrossFit in some regards and how some of the things that we do are most certainly not classic CrossFit. I mean, running the clock is classic CrossFit, assigning load to the workouts is classic CrossFit, and a lot of that stuff that we don't do, there are undoubtedly observations and evolutions that, that have been made and we'll continue to make them. We don't stay static, you know, when. When think we do what makes sense, we do what's effective, and we keep our eyes and ears open, and that's, and that's in my opinion why we're going to try to keep leading the charge here, doing smart things, taking care of our knees, back, and shoulders, and living long, healthy lives. And um, that's what you can count on me for. That's what I'm here for. Okay, next most upvoted question, or just going down the list here. Sean M says, the other day on the 30 minute hang power snatch imam dropping the bar versus not dropping the bar, bar positives or negatives so i think what you mean by that sean is once you've executed a power snatch hang power snatch you have it overhead dropping the bar from right down dropping the bar onto the ground and then or lowering it back down to the hang and then putting it back down on the ground absolutely no need at all to lower the bar back down to the hang dropping it from overhead totally 100 percent good to go and so what i would say pros or cons positives or negatives it really is very much up to the individual and especially if you're doing a heavy lift which was the intent on that 30 minute imam there's probably a whole lot of people in the world that once you lock that barbell out overhead lowering it back down to the hang with the jolt on your upper body to do that and the impact on your on your hip area isn't going to feel good doesn't really have a ton of benefit in my opinion and, and you don't need to do it so i would think for most people dropping that bar from overhead would be the preferred method 
Uh, let's see. Scott M. You recently said on a podcast, on one podcast or another, that you weren't a huge proponent of the sumo deadlift high pull because there are better ways to achieve the same goal. While I too share the sentiment, I'm interested in how this came to be since you are a former seminar staff member and former flow master. Oh, well, I mean, quite frankly, that was just, that was around before I joined the seminar team and, and used to work for them and all that stuff. And that was just one of the nine foundational movements that, that uh, Greg chose to put in there. Obviously a movement that he liked, thought had value, thought had you know, had utility, made it a, in his opinion, thought it was a good way to teach people um, you know, on their progression to fitness and whatnot. And, you know, I just would have replaced it with a power clean. That's all, you know, just, it's just that, that simple. So it's okay to have disagreements uh, with people. And I just would have, if I had the opportunity to edit those nine movements, I'd, I'd put in the power clean there and that's all. Um, why precisely that was chosen? I couldn't, I couldn't tell you, um, you know, I might have some anecdotal stories or whatnot, but it was just one of those moves that's kind of always been in there, you know, and I'm, that's probably a very unsatisfying answer, so I, I apologize for that. Lisa D, here we go. I use the hook grip when I deadlift. Should I train myself to use a mixed grip? I'm 41 years old, 160 pounds, my current one rep max deadlift is 205 pounds and I've been doing CrossFit for three years. Realistically speaking, knowing my body, I don't see my deadlift getting over 250 pounds in my lifetime and I'm totally okay with that. As you should be, by the way. Fantastic. Uh, be, you know, your deadlift is great right now. Am I shortchanging myself in any way by not using the mixed grip on my deadlifts? Does it matter more if you have a heavier deadlift? So I actually personally Lisa, I would say the fact that you're not using the mixed grip is awesome. And if more people could deadlift heavy without using the mixed grip, with keeping that double overhand grip like you're doing, I think that would be the way. For most people, double overhand grip is a more taxing and more demanding grip. And so if you are able to do your one rep max deadlift with that grip, hook grip or not, that's really good. I mean, not only do you have a good deadlift, but you've got some strong grip strength as well. Where the mixed grip would come into play for most people, and this would be my recommendation for most people as well, is if you are building up to a heavy deadlift and you have more in the tank, you can put more weight in the bar, your mechanics look good, bar path is great, spine looks great, the whole nine yards, but your grip from a double overhand perspective is what's becoming the limiting factor to you increasing and putting more load in the bar, the bar is starting to slip out of your hands, that at that point, whatever that weight happens to be, that's when most people will switch from a double overhand to a mixed grip. They'll find it to be a stronger grip. But if you're not experiencing that, your grip strength is ample, and you can have a one rep max day without needing to do the mixed grip, I would say keep doing, keep doing what you're doing. As a matter of fact, you're doing something really awesome. Because if you think about it, as soon as you mix the grip, it could be great for the deadlift to pull more weight off the ground, but you're not going to clean something with a mixed grip. So that double overhand grip has a lot more transference to other movements than a mixed grip does. And it just depends upon your grip strength and if that becomes the limiting factor of your deadlift. Great question. Next most upvoted question from Christopher P. Do you think CrossFit athletes, high-level CrossFit athletes, that is, I think we're, we're talking games athletes, regionals, I guess they're called semifinals these days or whatnot. Do you think high-level CrossFit athletes are healthy or is there a line where performance focus takes away from long-term health and fitness and where is that line? What a cool question. Well, I guess I won't beat around the bush. I think that a lot of high-level CrossFit athletes, like games-level athletes, super competitive athletes, regionals or semifinals-level athletes, are probably not doing healthy things to themselves. I think they're really fit, but I think what they're doing is not healthy. And the two are related 
but they're also, you know, they've got some overlap, but they're a bit different as well. They're very profoundly fit, obviously. If we're defining fitness, which I think is the most wonderful definition that I've ever heard, as work capacity across broad time modal domains, you know, meaning that you can accomplish a tremendous amount of work a variety of work, variety of movements, variety of loadings, doesn't matter if it's short, medium, or long, you can do it, you can do it really well, and you can crush it, your ability to accomplish work. From that definition, which I wholeheartedly agree with, are those high-level athletes fit? Undoubtedly. Now, healthy, healthy would mean that the choices that you're making are going to be leading you down the road to a long, sustainable life where you are maintaining a wonderful and appropriate level of fitness, but then also your all of your internal markers inside your body. If you were to go to your doctor and get checked out with your blood work and all that would be good to go. The stress that you're putting in your knees, back and shoulders would be good as well. And you wouldn't be doing things that are potentially injurious or, you know, we talked about threshold training earlier, that you would be riding that line really well. I mean, I think the data is in by now. I know a lot of a lot of games athletes, and even many of them in their own admission would say that when they were training for the games and doing everything for that level, that they were not leading a healthy lifestyle that they would recommend to anyone else. They were exposing themselves and their bodies and their joints to a level of stress that wasn't ideal for the long term, but they weren't trying to do that. They were trying to be the best in the world at a given activity. And that was the risk. That was the price, you know, for example. And I don't think this is, I don't think this is a unique thing to CrossFit. I think at almost any top end of many sports, you see that, um, runners, marathoners, maybe that's an easy one. They might have some great metrics of whatever it is, VO2 max, cardiorespiratory endurance, you know, stamina, blah, 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 blah. There are plenty of other metrics you could measure them, but they would be wildly unhealthy. Power lifters, their strength and bone density is probably through the roof. A bunch of other metrics, not so good for long-term health. Players in the NFL, you've got some absolute beasts out there, you know, fit, fast strong, agile, and the impacts that they are exposing themselves to are 100% not healthy for long-term fitness. You know, a lot of that stuff just happens at the absolute pinnacle <clears throat> of any particular sport or whatnot. And it just kind of comes with the territory. So no, I think, I think there is a difference between you can be fit and not healthy. You can have some great health markers, but not be particularly fit. And our goal, in my opinion, what most recreational athletes' goal should be is to be both fit and healthy. And that's, you know, what we're going for here at Lynchpin. Okay, <clears throat> we got two more questions here. Let's see. One more from Eric CM. I went to a random CrossFit gym over the weekend to have fun and compete with some other community members. But I didn't enjoy it since I kept quote unquote judging the programming versus our programming. How can I enjoy without criticizing workouts? Should we just flow with the experience or better to investigate the programming style before arriving? Good question. Honest question. Uh, I struggle with this myself um, because I'm obviously obsessive compulsive and uh, about this entire strength and conditioning world and I see everything through that lens. And so if I do happen to be traveling or popping into a gym or whatever it happens to be, and I go on the website and I check something out and I, I, I just can't help but look at it. And, you know, sometimes you can see something in isolation and immediately make a judgment about it. Sometimes you can't judge something based upon one single deal. So I look at the workout today. Was that a good workout? Maybe, but what happened yesterday? And what happened the day before that? And then you look and you're like, Hmm. Well, that sucks. I don't like anything about that. Or you're like, Oh, that's cool. Well done. I like what you got going on there. Um, and it's a big world out there. It's a big fitness world. There are plenty of good gyms that are doing things quite well. And there are plenty of gyms that 
I would rather avoid. I mean, that's just a true statement right there. There's plenty of both. And I mean, I think the last time that my wife and I popped into a gym together, which has been a while, and I actually did a, a podcast about it and left out the name of the gym to protect the the, uh, the innocent. But it was, you know, they did that silly, ridiculous, rush you through everything, part A, B, C, and D, got to work up to a heavy this, that, and the other thing before doing a, a workout after that. And it was literally just like that nightmare scenario that I talk about and rushed into a heavy day and we didn't want to be the oddballs that were like, this is silly, I don't want to do it. You know, I'm a, I'm a guest in their gym. And so we just, you know, asking your question, we, we went with the flow and, you know, kept a smile on our face and went with the flow and didn't want to be a stick in the mud. And my wife tweaked herself, hadn't tweaked herself in years. And now we do this rushed, silly, lift heavy before you got to do something and she tweaks herself. Now, I guess that could be a coincidence, right? Maybe that's just the day she would have tweaked herself, but I tend to think it wasn't a coincidence. You know, play stupid games, win stupid prizes. And so if I've got the freedom to avoid getting into an environment like that, I always avoid going into an environment like that because it's just not worth it. If we're going to happen to go somewhere and I'm going along with the flow and we walk into something and, hey, good news, we're going to do A, B, C, and D today, like I'll, I'll be a good boy and I'll do it. But I'm here to tell you, I will, within the confines of that environment, make the best decisions that I can. I ain't going to try to get anywhere near a really heavy single. Mm-mm. That's not good or smart. I'm going to keep it light or moderate because I don't want to roll that dice and then, you know, whatever it is. So yeah, it can be, it can be difficult, but Hey, you know, sometimes it's nice. You just go with the flow make the best decisions that you can. And, um, as often as you can, you know, control your environment and go in some place that's going to be relating to that other question, putting you on a path of long-term health and fitness and making good decisions. Okay. Final question from Bradley H. This is from the BTW squad. What's the best way to approach a percentage based lift or workout if I don't have an established one rep max on some workouts? So I don't think this needs to be as potentially complicated as you think it might be. So uh, let's say, you know, this relates to what I said earlier, right? Where at Lynchman, we don't always just give you a Pers- uh, a prescribed weight to do, and especially on something like a heavy day at a high heart rate, will most likely use a percentage. So a workout that jumps into my mind as I can use for maybe Bradley's example is there was that nasty yet beautiful heavy day at a high heart rate that had deadlifts. And I think it was burpee box jump overs. Maybe it was over the bar, but I think it was burpee box jump overs. And I think it was four intervals of 10 deadlifts at 70% of your one rep max and 20 burpee box jump overs. And you're gonna do that four different times and you are gonna rest, you know, like a one-to-one work to rest ratio between each one of those. So again, one interval was 10 deadlifts at 70% of your one rep max and then you burn it down with 20 burpee box jump overs as fast as you can. That was a great heavy day to high heart rate, interval style training, all that good stuff. Well, you need to know your one rep max deadlift to use 70% of that. Now let's say you hadn't done a one rep in a while, haven't established it and you don't know what 70% would be. You've got a couple options. Listen to the video that I make each day, right? And I I would assume that I said something during that video where, you know, 70% for most people is going to be a heavy challenging set for 10, where obviously you maintain your good mechanics the whole time, but ideally you can do it and it's a tough, unbroken set of 10. And then you drop the bar and get into the burpees. That it shouldn't be broken up into a five, three, two. That's too much weight on the bar if you did that. You shouldn't just blow through it. It shouldn't be really easy. 70% for a 10 is a, it's a good set. So based upon that, even if you didn't know your one rep max, you could have maybe after your general warm up started building up your weights as you warm up your deadlift And as you put a little more weight on the bar, did some reps, put some weight, did some reps, you would probably start to get an idea of like, hmm, this actually feels like if I put a little bit more weight in the bar, yeah, it's going to be a challenging 10. 
you could make that decision. And you know what, let's say you did that and you executed the workout that way, getting back to that threshold training and learning about yourself, right? You did the workout and then in reflection you go, I'm a little more capable than I thought. You know what, I used whatever weight on the bar because I thought that'd be about 70%. It didn't feel challenging enough. Put that note into your BTWB app and you're learning about your deadlift that day. Conversely, you might've learned in round two when it turned into a five, three, two, I got too much weight on the bar. That's okay, strip the weight down mid-workout, good to go, figure it out. You know, it, it's all learning. You're pulling deads, you're challenging yourself, fitness is being achieved. It's not perfect, but it's good. And you're doing good work and you're learning, you're safe, life's awesome. Or there would be nothing wrong with before that particular workout that I just mentioned, maybe you work up to a heavy single, okay? Now that's not, if you have the time and the inclination and all that good stuff, don't rush because then you're getting into that trap that I said earlier where you're rushing something and that's not smart lifting heavy weights. But if you're in your garage and you have the time, build up to a heavy single and while a heavy single is taxing, we're not talking about doing a seven by one day where you're gonna pull seven heavy singles with three minutes of rest. I mean, there's a central nervous system attack. You'll just work up, get into the neighborhood of a heavy single Maybe it doesn't even need to be a true one rep, but a heavy single, you know, and then you're like, okay, now I've got a really good idea as to where I am. And then you can use that percentage based upon, you know, do the 70%. I see Nick also posts here and BTWB will estimate what a one rep max could be for you based upon your other entries of the same movement. And in this case, it will suggest what 70% might be for you. So once again, the people at BTWB, which are profoundly smarter than me. I have it also, you know, some good tech worked out in the app there. That's why we're on BTWB. And so you've got that for yourself as well. So hopefully that helps. Um, excellent questions. Thanks everybody. It's a rest day. I'll tell you what, all of you are awesome. I mean, what did we do yesterday? What did we do? We did 45 minutes of either max calories on the air bike, on a rower or just out running for 45 minutes. Do you know how many people in the world would avoid that or not do it? I'm here to tell you a lot. And then they would wonder why they're not getting the gains that they should or why they're not as well-rounded as they should or any of that good stuff. And so many people in the linchpin community did that and were very open and vocal that they didn't want to do it, which is great but did it anyway, and there's the key. The un and here's another also key, is they understood why it was beneficial. Even though you may not have wanted to do it, through all of these linchpin conversations, through the, the knowledge that we share with each other, you understand why it is we're doing what we're doing, and that helps give you the discipline to say, you know what, <sighs> I wish this was something else, but I'm going out for this 45 minute deal. And the fact that you are a community of people that has the discipline to make those decisions is why we're going to help each other stay on a nice path of long-term health and fitness and being smart with our body while still making great gains. So that's it. Have a great day. Enjoy your rest day. I certainly will. I'm going to go get some more coffee and we'll talk later.